Good to see you, Chuck. High blood pressure. When I was looking it up for today's show, I was stunned to hear that nearly half of all adults in the U.S. have it. What is the current criteria, the clinical criteria for high blood pressure? Yes. Yeah. By, uh, by the way, uh, back to where you were starting about why this is such a terrible thing, this is why it's so, uh, so expensive. It's not really that people have to go and buy blood pressure pills. That, that's a big part of it. They are pricey, and often you're on two pills or three. Um, but the, the thing about it is it affects your heart, and it affects your kidneys. It affects other parts of your health. So all the health costs that you need to treat, all of them, those are all adding up into that astronomical figure. It's not just the blood pressure itself. But I, um, the criteria that we want to aim for is 120 over 80. That's uh, a good one, and it's been around for a long time. And there have been some mild adjustments here and there to it, but that's still a good number. And what that number means is that the doctor, nurse, medical technician, or yourself, you put the cuff around your arm and the blood pressure will go up to 120 and down to 80 with each heartbeat. When your heart is contracting, it goes up to 120. When it's relaxing, it goes down to 80. That's systolic, diastolic. Systolic, diastolic, 120 down to 80. Um, if you are higher than that with either one of those measurements, we're going to say that's higher, we, higher than it should be, but we want to bring it down. Um, a lot of people will say, well, gee, you know, I changed my diet. I'm way below that. I'm now 100 over, over yeah, 65 or something like that. That's dangerous. Um, the answer is if you're a healthy person, no, but lower blood pressure is a, thing, is a good place to be. All right, well, let's go ahead and see if we can't bring that blood pressure down. Our first question comes to us from Tessie, who is wondering what are the best foods to lower high blood pressure? Ah, great question. Uh, so what can we do about it? There, there are really a couple of different strategies that we're aiming for when we're picking um, the first one you already know about. We want to get away from high sodium food and get toward high potassium food. Sodium brings blood pressure up, potassium brings it down. We also want to get away from high fat foods and go toward low fat foods. Fat brings blood pressure up too because it makes the blood thicker, more viscous, harder to move, and that raises blood pressure. And the final thing, third thing, is foods that help you lose weight. So low fat, vegan, high fiber foods, those all help. So what specifically are we thinking about? All right, I want to have a food that doesn't have a lot of fat, doesn't have a lot of so uh, sodium, has a lot of potassium. Vegetables, fruits, whole range, they are going to be your very best friends. Uh, along with them are the bean group and the whole grain group. What are the worst? Okay, the, the three worst foods are cheese, cheese, and cheese. <laughs> the reason I'm saying that is that the cheese is really high in saturated fat. It's got sodium too. Yeah, hold on to your blood pressure. Um, if I have potato chips, two ounces of potato chips, 330 milligrams of sodium in that fat. If I have some cheddar, it's got more sodium. Yes, it has more sodium than potato chips. Uh, 350 of this is Alveda, it's 800 milligrams of sodium in two ounces. So, Get away from the cheese, get away from the meat in general. So, vegetables, fruit, whole grains, beans, get away from the animal products. Uh, oh, by the way, one other thing. Coconut oil, palm oil has been marketed a lot, so throwing them out. Shine your shoes with them, don't you? <laughs> you know, you mentioned potato chips uh, just a minute ago. I'm glad that you did because we have a question from Sabrina. Potato chips, absolutely a vegan food, and if you spent any time in the grocery store recently, you've noticed that there are more and more vegan options on store shelves. But Sabrina is wondering, can those processed vegan foods, like the ones you find in the frozen food aisle, also raise blood pressure? They can if you did one of the things that we were talking about, added a whole bunch of sodium, or added a lot of bad fats. Those are the two ways to ruin it. Now, processing itself, yes, it's a bad thing, but it's not such a terrible thing. If you take of wheat, grind it up in the flour, and you make spaghetti out of it, that's fine. Um, as long as you're not putting something bad, uh, bad on top of your spaghetti, that's a perfectly fine food, even though it's processed. Where we run into trouble is when people start adding uh, a lot of sodium and a lot of fatty foods, especially the coconut palm oil. That's when you really run into trouble. 
take a question from Andre. This is a really good one, and I think it's something that a lot of people do immediately when they're told that they have blood pre high blood pressure. It's the first thing that they do. Andre is wondering, is cutting out table salt enough to lower blood pressure? Um, it's a good idea uh, as a general rule, but, but the amount that you, if you added up the salt that ends up in you, the amount that came from your salt shaker is almost insignificant. The, the big driver is the salt that was in the food first. So this is where cheese is a real baggie, um, as for the reasons that I mentioned. It's, it's integral to the production of cheese products. But then, it's the cheese that was added at the factory as it was being, as the product was being processed. Uh, for example, green beans, very low in sodium when they're grown. And that's true of almost all plant foods, very low sodium. But when they put them in a can, the manufacturers realize you'll buy it and you'll like it more if I throw in a whole bunch of salt. salt. It's not in the green beans naturally. They, they just add it. So that's really the issue. And that's more important than the sodium you add at the table. So what does this mean? Um, a lot of restaurants that are trying to have healthy foods or people who are doing this at home have come to the conclusion that when you're at the recipe stage, keep the sodium really low. And then allow a person to have a salt shaker. So they can put a little bit of salt like, like on the surface of the food. And so they're adding a bit that taste, think it's okay, but the amount that was actually kind of baked in how it's really quite small. All right, let's pivot right now. We're going to come back to blood pressure in just a moment, but let's pivot and take an important question from Oliver. This is top of mind with a lot of people right now. Oliver wrote in, wondering, will a healthy diet help reduce the dangers of the Omicron variant? Ah, uh, uh Hugely important thing, obviously. Um, quick caveat, we're all learning from this virus. Um, we already know that it is transmissible, it's moving. Frankly, from day to day, we are watching the, the movement of the virus. And to say a couple of obvious things, it's here, it's showing, as we've always been talking about since the beginning of the pandemic, that viruses are working to find new hosts. Omicron, like every other coronavirus, cannot exist outside of an animal's body. So that's why when it sneezed out from somebody, it's going to somebody else and it's got to get there to survive. And when it goes to a new person, it's got a new immune system to try to negotiate with, and that's where the, the virus mutates. Uh, so as viruses transmit from one person to another, they change. So Omicron is really different. Uh, Delta was different from the uh, coronavirus we were dealing with at the beginning of of 2020, 2021, Delta was different, but not hugely different, meaning the spike protein on the surface of the virus, which is the target of the vaccine, uh, or the vaccine crime to immune system to target that, that wasn't really hugely different. So the Delta variant um, can be reduced by the vaccine, just like the, uh, uh, just, just like the, the variants that precede it. So what about Omicron? With Omicron, it looks, who knows, uh, we're gonna pull a lot more in about six weeks than we know now, um, but it looks like there is some potential for changing those proteins. If that's the case, that could cause the vaccines to work less effectively. And we've learned that foods do indeed make a difference for uh, the coronaviruses up and through Omicron. So now the question, and I think this is what you're getting at, Oliver, uh, could food still work against uh, against the Omicron? And the, the tentative answer is, I think they will. Here's what we know. Uh, there was a big study called the COVID symptom study. You've probably heard the talk about this. As soon as the pandemic began, uh, more than 500,000 people voluntarily tracked their symptoms. And of these, about 30,000 developed COVID. And so then people looked at foods that helped them, foods that, that, that made uh, infections worse. And that's where some of the data came in showing if you're on a more or less plant-based diet, your risk of severe COVID is cut by a good 40%. So, okay, great. Chalk one up for plant-based diet. And then there was another uh, similar study looking at six different countries showing the same thing. Plant-based diets really reduce the risk, especially of severe COVID. Um, so, and forgive me for this long answer, Chuck. Um, so, 
somebody comes in, That's they got out of town, they change their, they've been on a plant-based diet, are they going to be less likely to have severe illness? Your, I, I don't believe that changes in the spike proteins are going to have any, I, I don't think that's going to be a problem with regards to the efficacy of the diet, because what's the diet do? The diet facilitates your immune strength. You're creating antibodies to a virus, whether you've been vaccinated or, or not. Um, if, if you've been vaccinated, you're primed. If, you, um, if, if, if you haven't yet been exposed to it, then you can't produce antibodies until you get the initial exposure. You also have white blood cells that are there to result in danger. It looks like people on plant-based diets have stronger antibody responses and stronger uh, white blood cell responses, and that will probably hold true regardless of the variant. That does not mean that you are bulletproof if you are vegan, <laughs> nor does it mean that you should not get vaccinated or anything like that. It doesn't mean anything like that. What it means is that when the virus comes, call it. If you've been on a healthy plant-based diet, it's going to help you to keep a low body weight, low cholesterol, and low blood pressure. You have a strong measure of added protection against viruses based on the best data we have. That includes the uh, variants up until now, and we'll be reluctant to them. Yeah, and let's not forget the uh, study that was recently conducted by our colleague, Dr. Hanna Kaliova. I believe you were involved in this as well, uh, at Sibley Hospital in Washington, D.C., yeah. that tracked uh, the benefits of a plant-based diet among hospital workers throughout the pandemic. Um, and that showed some very positive results in terms of their health, despite the fact that there is this pandemic that was raging around them at times. It, it's good that you mentioned that, Chuck, because one of the things that we see is during the pandemic, everybody was under stress. And the question was, is stress going to affect your immune system? You, you have to think it would. Um, and if there's anybody under maximal stress, during the pandemic is the hospital worker. And yes, Dr. Kaliova, her team, and I was pleased to be part of this, um, brought to Sydney Memorial Hospital here in DC to the hospital workers themselves a healthy plant-based diet and just, just once a week support environment. And exactly what you would hope happened, happened, which is people up today. Their cholesterol came down, but physically they were healthier. But then we looked at just quality of life. Sure. How could you have any quality of life during a pandemic when you're a hospital worker? The answer is their quality of life improved, and they were able to get better care. And Dr. Kaliopa will be joining us here on the program in the very near future. Uh, she and I are going to be getting in depth about the study, which was just absolutely fascinating. Um, I can't wait to share those particular results with everybody. I think that it's going to be great. Um, and I also want to take a second, Dr. Barnard, to say hi to everybody who's joining us today. The exam room is in the chat room. They're active as always. Mommy Vegan Numi. That's a, that's a fun name. Uh, Salad Strong Soprano. I'm assuming that you are a singer. Mike Jones is here. Tofu Tuesday is always joining us on a Wednesday. Riri eats what? I don't know what Riri eats, but I am glad that they are here. Uh, and our friend Richard Hubbard, also in the chat room. At 12.08 today, Richard has a question wondering, uh, going back to blood pressure that we were talking about at the top of the show, Richard is wondering, when is the best time of day to check your blood pressure? Does that matter? Um, uh, the time of day doesn't matter so much as what you were doing immediately before. Here's the scenario that will happen. You go to the doctor's office. You were struggling to get there on time. You were racing through traffic. You had to find a parking spot. You run up the stairs. You go in. They ask you for insurance cards couldn't find it, you're frustrated and annoyed, then they want to check your blood pressure. <laughs> of course, it's like way much higher than it would, would have been um, had you had a chance to relax. So in our research studies, we have a rule. Uh, the patient comes in, sit them down, let them sit for at least five minutes in a room that's quiet. Don't read anything. Don't read the stock market. Uh, don't tell jokes. Don't laugh. Don't do anything. Just chill out. And what you will see is if you take their blood pressure every, say, minute or two minutes, it goes down, 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 down. And the blood pressure reading that matters is the one that is, is at the bottom, where your blood pressure has stabled out and the stresses of the day are gone. So whether it's daytime, middle of the day, uh, nighttime, what really matters is that you have been quiet beforehand. So with that in mind, a lot of people do it before they get out of bed in the morning. That's fine. Uh, but the key is just be quiet for five, ten minutes before you, before you take it. 
Take a question from Ram at 1212. Can high blood pressure be reversed or do you have it for good once you have it? It can definitely be improved. Um, absolutely. If you have high blood pressure, do see your doctor. Um, you do want to take it seriously. And if diet and lifestyle don't change it, you need to think about medicine. Because high blood pressure can kill you. Um, that said, even if you're on medicine, you want to do the diet that we talked about. Eliminate animal fat. Keep high sodium foods low and high fat foods low because as I said before, um, the fat increases the thickness, the viscosity of the blood. You get that out of there, your blood is thinner. It can flow more easily. You don't need so much blood pressure. Um, and what you'll see is two things. If you make these changes now, Wednesday, your blood pressure will start to descend over, within the next couple of weeks, your blood pressure is going to come down. The DASH study showed us that. You see a decisive drop in blood pressure within 14 days. However, let's say you're losing weight. And you lose a little bit of weight this week, next week, the next week, and maybe over the next 6, 8, 12 months, you're continuing to lose weight because of your healthy vegan diet. That weight loss adds to the blood pressure lowering effect over the long run. So absolutely, blood pressure changes. There are some people where it's a little more resistant to change than others, but the vast majority of people live that. So, we have a couple of people right now, Dr. Barnard, in the chat room who are wondering whether a change in their diet can result in having blood pressure that is then too low, and what could be done about that. Have you heard of something like that happening? Um, well, it depends on who's interpreting too low. Um, if the person taking your blood pressure says, gee, my blood pressure's never been that low, um, if that person were to follow it, I'll be Come down to. Um, the, no, the short answer is if you got this through diet, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, you mentioned getting coconut oil out of the diet. Eleanor, 1212, is wondering what about coconut milk? Look at the fat content um, on the back of the carton and compare it to the almond milk and the rice milk and the others. What you'll typically, and, and folks, especially on saturated fat, if that number is zero, that's my favorite number. You'll have a, have a look in this uh, Mommy Vegan Nummy. Okay, there it is, the fun name. Uh, 1212. Boy, they're chatty at 1212 today. Uh, wondering whether alcohol can raise blood pressure. Yeah, it can. Um, modest alcohol consumption, modest, you know, a drink every couple days, no big deal. Uh, when people make it a big part of their life, it's going to be a problem. And Darius, 125. Is it a good idea to cook without? any salt to avoid hypertension. So again, we talked about getting it off of the table, but what about the cooking altogether? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I would not add it in the cooking. If you're going to add it, add it to the table. By the way, for extra credit, if you add salt at the table, which I think it's okay, um, simply because the amount that goes in, you know, it's not on the surface of the food, it really becomes very, very, it's, it's very, very small. Um, if you're adding salt, I'm going to say it's totally unfashionable. Instead of sea salt, Himalayan salt, kosher salt, let's get some iodized salt. Now, you can get iodized Himalayan salt, but that iodine is good for your thyroid. And salt has to be one of the very few oh, sources that people can reliably have. So, that, uh, okay, so yeah. then that would take, uh, you know, like the Himalayan pink sea salt off of the table. Like, that wouldn't be a good option because, odds are, that one has not been iodized. It's not iodized unless it says so on the label. But but they're they're wising up to this because they 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 they're reading the same thing that you and I are reading. They realize that a lot of folks are are starting to not get the iodine they need because ordinary salt has been replaced by these non-iodized. I like the color. So it's good to have iodized salt. Let's hop back to uh, talking about giving the immune system a boost. That came up while you were talking about Omicron a moment ago. Again, mommy vegan nummy, uh, twelve fifteen this time. Wondering whether there are fruits or vegetables that will make our immune system smart. So are there any that perhaps are more beneficial than others? Researchers have been checking the effects of various foods. Uh, probably the, the, the two biggies that were, have been in the headlines a lot are vitamin C, rich foods. You know which ones they are, the famous are the citrus fruits. The ones that are more modest and don't want to brag are things like broccoli and other vegetables that do have vitamin C too but it tends not to be so much in their marketing and may not be quite as, as vigorous as in some of the state of citrus. Yeah, thank you. Uh, does vitamin C help against viruses? Probably. Um, the data are all over the place, but for ever since Linus Pauling won his two Nobel Prizes, people have taken vitamin C really seriously. It does seem to help 
Uh, regarding coronavirus, I don't think we've got the data to show that it's applicable there, but generally speaking, it does seem to be this useful. Uh, the other big area is um, garlic. And garlic has been shown to have some, uh, what, what appears to be an antiviral effect. What, what I mean is, you bring in volunteers. Half of them get placebo, half of them get a garlic extract. And you show that the people getting the garlic have a lot fewer viral cultures. I mean, measurable. Uh, I do think that we have to take this with a grain of salt, too. And that's because some of these studies are, are uh, funded by the people who are making garlic extracts, but the data does seem to say that. Uh, anecdotal here, but worth mentioning nonetheless from Randy Carroll, no relation. Uh, Randy writes in the chat I caught COVID while with my daughter and son in law. She says, I'm totally plant-based while my daughter is mostly, but my son-in-law is not. She says, I fared much better than both, and I'm 30 years older. So that kind of goes back to what it was we were talking about with the Sibley study and everything you were talking about as far as how a diet can help with those comorbidities that lowers the risk of having one of those severe COVID infections. You know, Chuck, I'm really glad that you shared that comment because so many people have the idea that we'll never be as healthy as our, our children. Um, they've got, uh, let's say you're 50 and you've got kids who are 20, 25, and so forth, and they're strong and vigorous and so forth. But what you discover is that the idea that 50s and 60s were, that meant you were old. A lot of it really just meant that you had been kind of beaten up by your diet and lifestyle more than somebody younger had been. And so when people are on a healthy, plant based diet, you're not going to live forever, but you should be vigorous and strong in your 50s and your 60s and beyond. Um, this is not the end of life. And if you're feeling sluggish, if you gain some unwanted weight and so forth, it's not the calendar that does that. It's the food. And when you change to a healthier diet, uh, yes, you can, uh, you can be as healthy and vigorous as you can. Would you believe that a couple of weeks ago when I was in Vancouver speaking at the Planted Expo, a woman came up to me, she said, uh, and she was, by the way, in her late 70s, early 80s. She said, I went vegan after seeing a video, Dr. Barnard, that you and I had done, one of these Q&As. Mm -hmm. And she said she has never felt better in her life. She feels like she regained her health, and she was just gushing. And I was just blown away that here is somebody's grandmother who is literally outrunning her grandchildren at this point and feeling fit as a fiddle. So it goes to show, just as you said, it is never too late to improve your health. Exactly right. Uh, let's go ahead now and uh, switch gears. I want to take a follow-up question to a conversation that I was having with Dr. Benita Ramon last week. Uh, the title of that show is, What Happens When We Stuff Ourselves Silly? Uh, so, Sparkly <laughs> here, brother, <laughs> wanting to know, how does stuffing yourself silly affect the heart? We're talking about heart attacks. Does it overtax other organs like the pancreas or the liver? So, what are the dangers of course? Yes. It sounds like last week must have been Thanksgiving, doesn't it? <laughs> Indeed it was. <laughs> uh, yes, gorging yourself, don't do this at home. Don't do this anyway. Um, if you're wondering if it's bad for you, yes, it certainly is. The obvious thing is that we see it on the scale. Of course. You're gorging means you're eating more than your body really wants you, and so you're forcing it in. Um, and you will gain weight, and this is the time of year when people do it. Uh, the days are getting shorter, darker, colder. So our inner squirrel comes out and says, winter's coming, I better bury a bunch of nuts and stuff like cheese and, and eat as much as I can, get ready for winter, and, and uh, we do. Is old. And it's not just the party, we see that <laughs> playing in the background. this time of year, and your average American game is time of year, this time of year, don't do that. Um, but it's not just your weight. Uh, when, when those maladjusted people who derive stuff they and use to yeah. make yeah. foie gras, Foie gras means fatty liver, and it means it's a diseased liver. And what they're doing is they're overfeeding birds intentionally. Now, don't ask me what kind of sadistic person would do such a thing or who would order it on the menu, but it does cause liver disease. Uh, it, it causes fatty liver because you've got way too many calories that you can expend, your liver gets fatty. It doesn't stop the liver, uh, with the liver. You'll see uh, fat building up around the heart, around other organs, um, and it will be a damage. So, um, eating the amount that you need, leaving it at that, that's, that's what your body's really hoping to do. 
Uh, Follow-up question to the fast that we were talking about in the diet, Harriet 1222, saying, when you say fast, Dr. Bonner, does that include things like avocado and nuts? Well, avocados, nuts, these are natural foods, and they, they, they are very different from the other plant foods in that they are naturally pretty high in fat. Um, and so the question is, is it a problem? The type of fat in avocados and most nuts is, is certainly better than chicken fat, than beef fat. Better because it's lower in the saturated fat part that will raise cholesterol and it's probably makes to Alzheimer's disease. However, keep in mind what nature did. Nature made nuts and did not put them in little plastic packs and put them on the rack at the 7-Eleven for you to tear open and binge on. Nature actually packed each nut individual in a shell. It takes a lot of time to open up. And so given what nature had in mind, you're really not going to eat huge numbers of them. So where we run into trouble is having these be sort of a whole food group when, when not. That, that really doesn't have to be an issue. Where I really think it matters, uh, if a person wants to lose weight, getting anyway, away from nuts and guacamole is a really good idea. Um, we've talked about uh, improving diabetes. The key to diabetes is getting the fat out of your cells. That means getting it out of the diet too. Uh, for women with hormonal issues, uh, menstrual pain, uh, menopausal symptoms, they're getting away from fat to help for reasons that are not entirely clear. So, yeah, I would be cautious about these studies. And uh, let's take a question here from Nicole. You mentioned viscosity, and as long as we're talking about nuts, uh, Nicole is wondering, for trivia bonus points, can nuts increase blood viscosity? Yeah, they can. Um, your, your, um, your blood is, is based in water, and your blood cells, your red blood cells and white blood cells and stuff like that, things are all in this water and mix. And so what if I have a really fatty food? Uh, some of that fat ends up in your bloodstream and it ends up there pretty fast. And so imagine if you're sort of uh, whisking grease into a, a soup or something that, that's based on water. Will it get uh, thicker? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, yeah, so any fatty food will be done. Uh, let's take a, boy, we got a lot still on uh, high blood pressure today. Uh, Emily at 1223, can high blood pressure be a genetic trait along with high cholesterol? Yes, it can. Um, uh, there are people who, ha who have high blood pressure that they inherited it. Um, in the past, it, it was sort of dismissed as being 100% genetic and nothing you can do will change it. Uh, you don't really know that until you try. So take two, three months. Be totally vegan during this time. No animal product. If you do that, you'll be avoiding the fat that's in the animal product and whatever sodium you're consuming. Keep oils low, and then check how your blood pressure is doing. If it has absolutely not budged, then you can blame the genes. But for most people, it's just something else. I want to take a very important question here from Kama at 12:23. Right, uh, they've lost 35 pounds and saw a significant blood pressure drop after adopting a whole food plant-based diet. But Dr. Barnard, Kama also says that uh, they're trying to wean off of medication because they're getting dizzy spells. How quickly mm -hmm. can they wean off of that medication? Oh my goodness, I'm so glad that you raised that question. Here's what happened: You're on a vegan diet, you think this is a good thing. And you've been vegan for six weeks, and you're sitting at the table eating a vegan cookie. You found the best recipe. You leap to your feet to go to the store to get the ingredients, and just as you leap out of your chair, the, bill, the, the room starts going dark because your, your blood pressure is dropping really fast. Here's what happens. You're taking medicines for your blood pressure. You're still on those medicines for your blood pressure. They're really powerful. And the diet that you're on is as strong as the medicine, too. So the combination has lowered your blood pressure too much, and now you're getting woozy. So the answer is A, let the doctor know that you're making a diet change. The doctor will start backing you off your medication. And B, if this happens to you now, absolutely call your doctor. Don't throw your medicines away on your own, but talk to your doctor, and what your doctor is going to do is to reduce the doses or even just eliminate those medicines. And so many people who are on two or three medicines for their blood pressure, and either reduce them or get off them completely with a diet. 
Um, let's talk more about weight loss here. We have a few people in the chat room who are concerned that maybe they're a little bit underweight right now. They don't want to return to eating those high fat, heavily processed foods that we were talking about avoiding a little bit earlier, Dr. Barnard. So what advice could you give to somebody who feels like maybe they've lost too much weight and need to put just a few pounds back on, but they want to do it in a healthy way? Okay, great question. First of all, let's, let's think, is your weight a healthy weight or not? Um, because Today, in, in 2021, um, other people might say, you're kind of thin, but that's in comparison to the overall population of whom 60% are overweight. So just because you're thin doesn't mean you're not healthy. You might be the healthiest one around, and it may just be by comparison. But here's a way to tell. Go online and look up a BMI calculator. That's Body Mass Index. You'll see them on the web. BMI calculator. Plug in your weight, plug in your height. And if it's above 18 and a half, that means you are not underweight. If it's below 25, that means you're not overweight. So you want to be between 18 and a half and 25. Um, where those numbers come from? Um, that's the range where you don't see body weight contributing to health issues overall. Now the truth, I think, is that the healthiest People are in kind of the lower end of that window, uh, 19, 20, 21, 22. When your weight is getting above that, towards 24, 25, you start seeing health problems maybe starting to think about coming in. So if you're above 18 and a half, you're not underweight. I wouldn't worry about it. Um, if you want to increase your weight, you can do it the healthiest way to do it is simply make sure you're eating it. Eating plenty of healthy food. Secondly, make sure you're exercising. Exercise preserves your muscle mass, builds your muscle mass. It puts the weight where you want it to be. And the third strategy is that people have discovered that if they eat more oily foods, they gain weight, um, which we've been trying to avoid. Um, be careful if that's the strategy you use, because what will often happen is that you will gain weight from eating fatty foods. But it will be all around your waistline and not in some place where you might want it. Is there a, a target amount of fat we should be getting in our diet every day? What is the RDA? We have a few people wondering that right now. Yeah, um, the, 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 the true physiological need for fat is tiny. Uh, just a couple of percentage of your calories is really all the fat that your body physiologically requires. The rest is there just for entertainment. So if you are avoiding animal fat completely, animal products, and if you're cooking beans and grains and vegetables and fruits in unlimited quantities, but you're not adding fat to them, the fat percentage that you're going to end up with is going to be, oh, maybe around 8 or 10 percent fat as a, as a percentage of your calories. That's way below where Americans are because fat is added to um, the vegan pizza that you got at the store, um, uh, prepared foods and that kind of stuff in restaurant foods. Um, so your average American is more than 30% of their calories are from fat. Getting that down to around 10 is fine, but you don't need to count. You just eat healthy plant-based food and use non-oil cooking methods. Be careful about the nuts and seeds and the block, and make sure to take care of yourself. Uh, quick one, Tofu Tuesday says uh, she just took her blood pressure 105 over 60. Gets the old thumbs 